Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to Risky Fitness. And, uh, I'm super tired, but I'm a little behind on the tutorials and I wanted to get one out to you guys. Rather than not. Uh, as soon as I could. So, let's get into it. How to play PlayStation on RetroArch. Now, I think that RetroArch is the best emulation platform for PlayStation. A lot of people, I think, still want to use EPSXE, and I don't understand that at all, because EPSXE is overcomplicated to set up and use, uh, it's not rich in features, it's not rich in compatibility, it's not, it's not a good experience to play these games on EPSXE. It's a very good experience to play them through RetroArch, and you have options in RetroArch. So I wanted to go over a couple of those options. Now, I have the, the Live Retro Docs open to PlayStation Beetle PSX hardware, which is my preferred core for PlayStation, but there are a number of cores you can use. The reasons I prefer this core are because it uses your device's hardware in order to enhance the experience of playing the games, which is my preference, but you can also use the Beetle PSX uh, vanilla or software version, which does not use any hardware acceleration, so you play games then at their original resolution. And then there's also PCSX rearmed core, which is meant for devices with ARM processors like mobile phones, Raspberry Pi, uh, Fire Stick, and that also has no hardware acceleration or very limited hardware acceleration, but it does work on Windows as well. So you have the option of using that. I often use that for troubleshooting. If I'm having an issue getting something to work in PCSX hardware, I'll run it in rearmed just to make sure that the, uh, that the image works. And then I can rule out what could be the cause of the issues that I'm having. It's usually something having to do with hardware acceleration. So it's very handy to have those around. Now, the newer member of the family is DuckStation, which is also available as a standalone emulator. DuckStation, I used it a couple of times just to check it out. And I feel like it's roughly equivalent to Beetle PSX hardware, but I just prefer Beetle PSX hardware because I feel like there are more options. So that's my preference. Of course, you're free to use your own preference. And if you would prefer to play around with the other cores and see how you like them, you know, see which one works best for you, obviously I encourage you to do that. For the purposes of this tutorial, we're going to be talking about Beetle PSX hardware. Now, if you're emulating on a Raspberry Pi or another device, you're more likely using the PCSX rearmed by default. And that works pretty nicely out of the box, but we'll touch on that a little bit at the end of this video, just so you can kind of get a quick look at it. So let's talk just a little bit about Beetle PSX hardware. This has also been known as Magnafen PSX, and that's a standalone emulator as well. Just a quick rundown on the Live Retro blog, you can see the extensions that are supported. My suggestion is to use bin and queue files, but you can also use PBP files, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. It shows you here this rundown of the different features that are available, including, of course, some really cool stuff like retro achievements, retro arch cheats, controls, remapping, rumble, and the big one is disk control. I have another tutorial just about disk control that you can check out as well. Loading content runs down how bin and queue files work, especially in this emulator. As I said, uh, PBP is probably a better way to go in a lot of cases but bin and queue is the one that has the most compatibility. With bin and queue, you often will uh, find that everything works right away, whereas sometimes with PBP, you actually lose the CD audio tracks. And then uh, the only thing about bin and queue that I would caution you about is that these are very particular files. So if you have a bin and a queue and your queue file has a typographical error somewhere in the file name of the bin it's pointing to, your game won't launch. So that's something very, very important to bear in mind. Uh, and the Q files are just nothing but a text file. I'll show you that uh, as well as we go. Multi-disc games is covered in another, another video. We talk about compressed content. It talks about PDP, which is a fantastic format. Uh, I mean, there's really not a lot more here that is needed just to play games. So here's a breakdown of what you'll typically see in a PlayStation game. This is a rip of Tekken 2. Now this is ripped a little differently from what you might see out there in the wild. Uh, sometimes people will rip their discs with 
a large number of bin files. Sometimes it'll just be one single bin file. It really depends on how the software is configured to rip the game. But uh, RetroArch doesn't really care about that. As long as the queue file is properly written to point to those bin files, it's not a problem. What does happen all too often is somebody will dump their bins and then they'll go ahead and write up a queue and make a mistake in the queue and then it won't, it won't launch. And then they, of course they put that out into the world and then people wonder why their games don't work. So let's take a real quick look at this queue file. The bin files are just binary files. That's just kind of a catch-all extension used in Windows for any data, really. It could be anything. So we're just going to leave those alone because if we try to open those in anything, it's just going to come up as gobbledygook. Uh, you may be able to open them in like a CD reader, and it's just, but it's just going to give you files that aren't going to do anything, if Windows can even see them. So for our purposes here, we're going to go ahead and open this queue up. We're going to open it up with Notepad, you know, t any text editor will do. Really all this stuff, the track and the index, is not super duper important. What's really super important is that these files match the names of these bins. That's the only thing that matters, and they have to match exactly. If you're playing on a Raspberry Pi that's Linux-based, has to be uh, has to match case also. That's very commonly overlooked. You'll have queues out there that don't have the right case for the bins, and they won't work on any Linux device. So just bear that in mind if you're running a Linux box. One really important detail that I'm adding in here at the end of the video is that you need to have a BIOS in order to run any PlayStation games, and those have to be in your system folder. Now, I can't tell you where to get a BIOS from, but just make sure you have it in your RetroArch system folder, and then you'll be able to play your PlayStation games. Thanks. So I've got one of my all-time favorite games here, Tekken 2. Let's go ahead and run that, and we're going to run it in that Beetle PSX hardware. And you see I have all the different, you know, uh, Raspberry Pi. So you can skip the BIOS and all that. I just wanted to kind of get really quickly into the game and just show you a little bit about what it's all about. So we're just going to jump into arcade mode. And if you look at this screen, you can see that it looks pretty typical PlayStation. Um, you can see there's a lot of pixelation here. Let's go ahead and start up a match. And you get a feel. So this is just out of the box with no enhancements of any kind. And it actually plays very nicely, and I think it looks pretty good. There's a lot of pixelation here, but there's also a lot of pixelation on the uh, on the original stuff, so something to bear in mind. Now we're going to pop into the options here. First thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and enable my on-screen overlay. And I know that uh, I have a whole other video for how to do these on-screen overlays. I just, this is my preference to have these on rather than not. Of course, that's totally up to you whether you feel you want to enable these. 100% your choice. So you notice a couple of things. You notice that the overscan is cropped. Let me turn off the audio here. So you notice that the overscan is cropped here. You have these kind of black bars on the sides of the screen. The background looks very, very bad. And there's, like I said, a lot of pixelation and stuff. So let's hop into the, into the options and let's see what we can do about all that. So we're going to go to our main menu, quick menu, and we're going to go to options. Now you have the option of creating a game options file, and I do recommend doing that with every game with the hardware uh, renderer because I really think it's important to uh, separate the settings of these games. Some are going to look and run better with different settings, but before we hop into that, I want to back out real quick and do something I, I showed way in the beginning in my very first RetroArch tutorial video, and that is the drivers. The drivers are super important, so go to settings and then drivers and just make sure your video driver is set to Vulkan. That's really, really important because if your video driver is not set to Vulkan, a lot of the features in the simulator are not going to work. So make sure that your video driver is set to Vulkan. Now, in addition to noticing a performance improvement when you're running this with Vulkan, you're also going to notice that there's a, a lot more options that are going to be available for you. So let's go into the options. Render, we want to keep that set to hardware. If you change the renderer within the within the emulator, it's going to break. So we're going to leave that alone. So software frame buffer, I always leave that on. Uh, 
you know, it has to be used, Vulcan has to be used in order for this to work, but if you look at the description, there are a lot of effects that are not going to work, period, if this is not enabled and if you're not using the Vulcan renderer. So if you want the most accurate experience possible, this is an absolute must-have. Now the internal GPU resolution is definitely up to you. My preference is I like to jack it up a little bit because the internal resolution of the PlayStation was like I think 256 pixels by 240 pixels or something like that. So I like to improve that and increase it. And when you increase that, your 3D graphics are going to be a lot nicer. So if you look now, look at how much nicer these 3D graphics are. These character models look way better. There's no pixelation, which I think is a huge improvement. It did require a restart in this case to get the 16x internal resolution working. So just bear that in mind. Uh, it might be a little bit difficult to get this running, especially if your hardware is not super powerful. But that's going to give you the best possible 3D rendering experience that you can get. So you're going to notice the backgrounds still look really terrible because those backgrounds are 2D backgrounds. And you'll notice if you look closely to these characters here, there's all this sort of gradient pattern on their clothes. It looks almost like, I feel like it looks kind of like an old comic book or newspaper filter almost. Uh, and that's because the PlayStation used a lot of dithering. Dithering being there to try and uh, smooth out uh, a lot of the artifacts and things. So I have a set at native resolution, which of course is going to be matching up to the internal resolution that uh, that was set you know, by the PlayStation hardware. Now if I set that to internal resolution, it's going to go ahead and use the resolution that I set up. So now if you look at this now, this looks a tremendous amount better. The background looks better, the characters look better, you don't have that sort of grainy pattern on them anymore, but the uh, polygons definitely look a lot more pronounced. So that's something to bear in mind as well. And again, this is all your preference. This is how I set my games up, but how you set your games up is totally up to you. I'm not going to tell you what to do. So we'll that a few more of these things here. The dithering pattern, I actually sometimes will turn off the dithering pattern depending what I'm playing and what I'm what I'm setting up. And I'll show you a little bit more as we go down here. So texture UV offset. Sample texture for 3D polygons and an offset for higher resolution. So basically it just means that you want to make sure that this is on if you are upscaling your textures like we just did by increasing the internal GPU resolution. Texture filtering is something that can really slow things down. Um, I like my linear for this. If you look at this now, it does blend the pixels a little bit, but I think it makes things look a lot nicer and much, much smoother. And of course, this is totally, again, your preference. I know a lot of people really dislike these kinds of filters. So it's up to you if it's something you would like to use or not. I like the bilinear. This also does come with quite a performance hit, so that's something to bear in mind as well. Excludes sprites from filtering. 2D sprite rendered backgrounds. Leaving this off will mean that the bilinear filtering does not touch those 2D backgrounds. So let's go ahead and play with this. So opaque only or opaque and semi-transparent. Uh, neither one of these seems to have a major impact on this game. The backgrounds look the same whether it's opaque or opaque and semi-transparent. I think they look best in this particular game when that feature is turned off. So we're going to save our game's options file. We're going to keep on moving here. And again, you might want to do this for every game that you play. Exclude 2D polygons from filtering. So that's kind of an interesting one. I haven't really played with this too much, but it's something that if you look at the description says used together with adaptive smoothing. So it's gonna be more in play with the next option that we use. So what does adaptive smoothing do? It's really cool and look at this, only supported in the Vulcan renderer. That's why it's so important to use Vulcan for this later. So it says it smooths 2D artwork and UI elements without blurring 2D rendered objects. So this could be really useful if you want to not use the bilinear filtering. 
and you want to try to get the 2D stuff to look a little bit nicer. So to me right now, I'm going to save this. To me right now, I think this doesn't look all that different from using the bilinear filter. But there's a little bit more to why this is useful. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on this really, really, really cool feature called super sampling. So down samples to the native resolution. So you upscale all your textures to a higher resolution, and then you turn this on and it downscales them back again. Now, with this option, it's gonna make everything look a lot more like the original experience of playing it without stretching everything and making it look distorted on your display. So when I use this one, I turn off dithering, and you can see it's recommended to turn off dithering. I leave texture filtering to nearest, and then we exclude our sprites from filtering. So now check out how this one looks. We made a whole bunch of changes there, so it's going to take a second to load. And now look at that. Now doesn't that look a lot more like what you're used to seeing a PlayStation look like? Kind of, right? But not quite. So I think the quality here is definitely improved, uh, but there's a little bit of a blur over everything. And that blur is part of that downsampling process. You'll see now we have visible pixels again. So this sort of undoes a lot of the pixel blending that we did before. And a lot of players prefer this kind of a look. This is also really useful in a lot of games like Final Fantasy VII or Legend of Dragoon RPGs where the entire background that you're moving around in is 2D because those backgrounds look so terrible against the foreground and uh, this makes that look a lot better. Now for this particular game it's not something that I'm going to use but I just want to show you when you do use it. What I also recommend doing is going into shaders and selecting a CRT preset. I think the slang uh, shader should work now because we're in Vulcan. Yeah. So CRT easy mode. Uh, I don't like the halation. Halation uh, turns the screen oval. I don't like that. So if you do that, now you have scan lines, and you have an experience that looks a lot more like a genuine PlayStation experience, but at a higher resolution so it looks nicer and less stretched on your display. Now I want to go ahead and do a couple more quick things here. I want to go back into our options. Anti-aliasing is nice to turn up as much as you possibly can, but again, that comes with a big performance hit, so just bear, bear that in mind. PGXP operation mode is something that's really cool. If you have issues with distortion or jitter, then you want to go ahead and enable this. A memory only is the preferred setting. But most of the time you don't need it. You only really need it if you have some glitches in your textures. Then you can go ahead and turn it on. Most of the time I wouldn't bother. Never touch this line to, line to quad hack unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> and then we have Frame duping, which is speed up. It's not something I like to use. GTE Overclock just runs the game a little bit faster. Now, core aspect ratio is the next thing I really wanted to talk about because the core aspect ratio here is corrected, but you can change that to Force NTSC or Force 4.3. I like Force 4.3. The reason I like Force 4.3 is because now that overscan is gone. Now, that does stretch things just a little tiny bit, but for me, it's not a big deal. It's not a deal breaker. I don't mind it. For you, you might dislike it. Now, I feel like the way this looks right now is probably the best way that it's gonna it's gonna look. You know, we've got our scan lines to smooth things out, while still having the original sort of low resolution graphics that we expect from the PlayStation. But of course, brought up to a high resolution and then artificially reduced back to their original resolution, so that the characters mesh a lot better with the backgrounds. So we don't have those really nicely smooth detailed polygons in the foreground anymore but now the foreground and background look good and make sense together so for this particular game i probably wouldn't always use this setting because i don't mind if the backgrounds don't look great 
but this is a setting that you're going to use a lot in your RPGs, your Final Fantasy, Legend of Dragoon, those kinds of games, it comes in very, very handy. Actually, if you look at my Legend of Dragoon video, it shows you a pretty great example of that. There is a widescreen mode hack. I don't like it. I'll show it to you. And I'll turn off the on-screen overlay. I'll show you the widescreen mode hack. Because if you look... Like... It actually looks pretty good, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> right? It actually looks pretty good. I'll be honest. Right now, it looks great. But it can... It doesn't stretch things out, which is great. What I don't like about it is that in some games it causes glitches. So I just leave it off for that reason. I'd rather not deal with the glitches if I don't have to. Apart from the graphics options, there are a number of other options that you can also adjust to your CD loading speed. It's something that I really like to change because a lot of times you'll find that your games load really slow. So I like to crank this up to the max as long as it doesn't cause any problems. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that uh, some games may not function properly if the options increase above a certain value. So you might have to sometimes reduce it depending on what you're playing. The memory card method can be adjusted based on whether you want it to act like Libretro or Mednafen, just for compatibility's sake. So if you use the standalone emulator before or you go between the two, you can switch this to make it work with both. Um, enable memory card one and shared memory cards means that all your games will save to the same memory card. Of course, then you run into the issue where you're going to have multiple memory card files. Right now, by default, it saves every game to its own memory card. But if you're doing something like, for example, you want to play Metal Gear Solid and you want to have, uh, you know, Psycho Mantis mock you for the games that you play, maybe you want to turn that to your memory cards. And of course, the analog self-calibration, the DualShock mode toggle. I've had issues getting these to work properly. I just leave my uh, controller set to analog controller um, and not emulate a DualShock because emulating a DualShock seems to slow things down a lot. So I usually don't use it. Multi-tap, if you want to have more than uh, two players. And of course you have your gun settings here as well, as now sensitivity, and you actually have Megcon controls, which is kind of cool. Uh, and as you can see, you can use the left analog stick to simulate the twist action of the Megcon controller. So that's kind of interesting. I haven't tried that. But we'll see. And then these memory card indexes, of course, control which memory card is inserted. So if you enable your multiple memory card, multiple games uh, to a shared memory card option here, you can swap your memory cards using these options here. So I just went ahead and you know came back to what my preference for this particular game was. Just to show, this is what this is what I like the best out of all the options that I tried. But of course, it is your individual preference. I'm not gonna tell you how to set up your game. You know, do what do what makes sense to you. If you don't like my settings, then you know, absolutely feel free to do the settings that you like best. So before I move forward, I just wanted to touch on a couple of other quick things. I wanted to go ahead and just show, like I said, I'm gonna show real quickly what Rearmed looks like. Just so you can kind of get a feeling of how it can be used. It's a great troubleshooting tool. So this is a completely different course. You'll see that none of the changes that we made in our Beetle PC, uh, Beetle PSX core are present, and it looks very much like a completely native, untouched, unmessed with image, which is really helpful when you are troubleshooting any issue that you might happen to be having. And if you look at the options here, they're very, very simple: frame, script, BIOS, region. A few little things, dithering, you know, and it's going on or off. A couple of sound options. And you can... Enable some graphic settings. If I enable the advanced graphics options, just to show you, there's some stuff that 
is used. And again, it's, it's mostly just for troubleshooting issues. There's really not anything you know, that advanced here. And you're going to get a much more simple and much more original PlayStation look and feel out of that particular emulator. Just something to bear in mind. And of course, before we totally wrap things up, I just want to very, very quickly show you uh, Duck Station. So now I'm running Tekken 2 in Duck Station. I just wanted to show you really quickly. It probably looks very familiar right now because it's going to be just an undoctored image. Now, some people have said they feel that Duck Station looks a little bit better. Uh, and out of the box, I think they might be right. It does look a little bit nicer. And I think for a lot of people, they were saying it has a lot more of an authentic look. There are obviously some issues here, um, you know, going on in menus and things, but just to show you, you can set fast boot console region, so a few different options here. Uh, preload CD-ROM image to RAM, which you can also do in in then defend. You can see the audio. GPU renderer. So you can change that between hardware, Vulkan, software. So that's something to bear in mind. Threaded rendering. Internal resolution scale. So again, you can scale the internal resolution. You can anti-alias. But I just really feel like there are not quite so many uh, useful options here. So you can see, and I'm just flipping around the options trying to see what works and what doesn't. And I got some issues here already, so. Yeah, a lot of issues here. Jeez. So you can see why I'm not really a huge fan of this particular uh, core, it just seems like a lot of these settings don't work as nicely as they are crazy about Duct Station for that reason, just all this crazy stuff going on in the background with the GPU. A little better, right? Okay, so we got it run. We got it run pretty good. I'll be doing a little bit of editing for this video, I think. So, you know, nothing really super special here. Nothing that we couldn't accomplish in Mednafen, which I'm just more, more used to and comfortable with. I like the way the options are laid out better. But of course, it's your preference. If you like Duck Station better, it's totally up to you. I'm not going to tell you what to do. So I hope that this tutorial has been informative. I appreciate the view. Please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and all that good stuff. I'll have more for you in the coming weeks.